From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Shap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to CMO Week on the MarTech Podcast. This week, we're talking to five CMOs to understand how they've navigated their way up the corporate ladder to become some of the most prominent marketers in the world. Joining us today is Kelly Brzozowski, who is the founder and executive director of Healthy Mature Living Foundation and a guest lecturer at the Stanford Byers Center for Biodesign. Prior to her current roles, Kelly was the chief executive and chief marketing officer at Butterfly Health, which is a company that developed a personal hygiene product for the protection of accidental bowel leakage. And she was the founder and managing director of the Lewis Carmel Consulting Group. Okay, here's our interview with Kelly Brzezuski. Kelly, welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you here. And I just wanted to double check Brzezowski. Did I say it right? Brzezowski. I was close. Brzezowski. It's a tricky one. B-R-E-Z-O-C-Z-K-Y. I apologize if I got it wrong. No worries. And feel free to just call me Kelly. Kelly B. That's probably the direction we're heading. I appreciate you coming on the show. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your career experience. Let's start off from the beginning. How did you get into marketing? It's an interesting question. I think from a very young age, my parents will tell you I probably had my first business when I was in middle school, but my actual career interest for a very long time was more oriented towards public service. Specifically, when I went to college, I thought I would be pursuing a career in the foreign service. And at some juncture, after a couple of political internships, I really shifted gears looking at a career in business. And at that juncture, I started researching where I thought I might have the best training to pursue that and landed upon the brand management program at P&G. And once I set my sights on that, I think I never looked back and I had an absolutely wonderful start of my career with that fabulous company. So this is the last of the five CMO week conversations we've had, and there's been a consistent theme for the marketers that are at the executive level. They all started in some sort of consumer packaged goods sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, whether it be Kraft or General Foods, General Mills or Procter & Gamble. Tell me what it is about those consumer packaged goods and the training program around those roles that was so foundational for marketing leaders like yourself? I think the brand management program, certainly, and you're exactly right, I started at P&G in the late 80s. The way they think about the brand manager and the brand management role is it's really marketing, but with a general management future in mind. So you're not only tasked with the value proposition of the business, but how do you build the business infrastructure and the business model to actually deliver that profitably back to the company? So I think there's an enormous amount of effort, certainly at the time I joined the company, in making sure that you had a well-rounded experience as you were progressing into your first brand management assignment. So you were at Procter & Gamble for a pretty significant period of time. Your LinkedIn profile says that you were there for eight years and you're a marketing director. I'm assuming you didn't start at the director level. Tell me about what the experiences were like working at Procter & Gamble earlier in your career and how did you move up the ladder in that organization to the director level? I think I'm going to start by telling you a story that was at the very beginning of my experience at P&G. 
when I had the fortunate opportunity to interview and was brought to Cincinnati, the day I interviewed, I was actually in the paper division and had the opportunity to talk to a few of the brand managers in that division, the Always Brand and Bounty Paper Towels. So when I went after I accepted the offer they made me, I actually asked the HR department if it was possible that I could work on the Always Brand. I had an interest in consumer health. The women that were working on the Always Brand were super smart, very capable. I thought they would be great mentors and a really great place to start. And I remember the HR gentleman that was handling my offer said, gee, Kelly, we've never really had someone, a brand assistant, ask to be placed on a certain business. But I think it was really just potluck where you landed. But he said, I'll make the request and let's just see what happens. And as luck would have it, I actually started on the Always business, which was an incredible business at the time. The brand had just launched a very breakthrough product called Always Plus where P&G had sort of invented the wraparound wings on a maxi pad. And that was a category that people may think, oh, you know, maxi pads, it's not a very exciting business. But you have to recall that Kotex actually owned that category for a very long time. Not only did they own the category, they defined the category. And P&G's path to market leadership and always took quite a bit of effort on the company's behalf. There was momentum on the business when I joined and the company had just launched their first entry point product. It was a product called Always Slender for Teens. And this is a product, their product development and their research department had done an enormous amount of research behind. And I think everybody in the company was convinced that having this entry point teen product was really going to be the product that sort of really catapulted the business even further into market leadership ahead of Kotex. So I had a great brand manager in Elizabeth Ron, who went on to be a VP marketing for the company. And she thought, oh, Kelly, this will be a great project for you as a brand assistant. We'll put you on a plane. You'll get to fly to Los Angeles and do focus groups, which is something I'd never done in my life. But nonetheless, I found myself out in LA behind this one-way glass mirror one by one, watching all of these teams on a product that the company believed was going to be the next big thing on Always. Right. One by one, these teams were saying, I don't want this pad anywhere near me. There's no way I would wear this product. What I want when I'm on my period and this is happening to me is what I want is a surfboard down there, not this shorter, slimmer maxi. And within a few weeks of being with the company, I came back to Cincinnati and I was brand new, so I didn't really know the lay of the land. And Procter is famous for its one-page memos. So I was working on my one-page memo of these focus groups and kind of told it like I heard it, which is consumers were kind of frightened of this thing. And you can imagine television advertising that started with this big pad and you could see the 3D effect of how they were making it shorter and slimmer was basically scaring not only these girls, but also importantly, their moms. Nonetheless, my one-page memo, which I had not intended, ended up making its way all the way up to the president of the company because this was the product that everybody thought was on its way to huge success. And quite honestly, it was headed for sort of a crash and burn. Right. Not because the product didn't work. And in fact, the product development team and the R&D team had done an enormous amount of research. The design of this shorter, slimmer pad was optimized for sort of a teen's smaller anatomy, if you will. And so it was supposed to provide more comfortable, better protection. But the marketing messaging was off. They was talking about being shorter and slimmer, and that was sending teens running to the ocean. So what it really showed me within just a couple of weeks in my first marketing role was that you really have to be open through your consumers and your customers' eyes. And that one of the most important roles of marketing is owning that value proposition with your consumer and customer, even in a way that sometimes senior management or other functions may not. Ultimately, you have to be the advocate for the consumer within your organization. And I think it takes sometimes thinking outside the box, but sometimes takes being disruptive. But I think in marketing, if you work with that fundamental curiosity, 
to always be focused on what is the winning value proposition for your consumer or customer. You begin to build the framework for having something that not only will be successful, but will stand the test of time. It sounds like there's a couple different things that happen. You know, the story that you're talking about. First, you're new into marketing and you're trying to dictate which direction you want to take your career, which to me is a really gutsy thing to do early on in your career. And you land in this role that there's lots of opportunity and you're probably uniquely qualified in the P&G organization to be able to handle as a woman in the organization. And then you have this other early learning that being customer centric and going and listening to your customer is providing value and that you got you a lot of exposure earlier in your career. Did the learnings that you had from working on the Always brand and taking a very customer-centric approach, did that help vault your career forward? Or was that just something that was impactful for you in terms of your understanding of marketing? Absolutely. I think it was fundamental to my career, putting the pieces of insight together that are really going to drive the business is what I took away from that experience. I think I was also supported by my management in being such an advocate for a new way of thinking about that business, that the combination of those two things opened the doors to a lot of future assignments for me, where doing the insight work to develop new marketing models was really key. So talk to me about some of the other projects that you worked in and how did you move up within Procter & Gamble? Did you stay on the Always brand and move up to that career path or did you bounce around to other different products? I bounced around. Like all in brand management, it's typical for you to work on a couple of businesses before you move into a brand manager role. Mm -hmm. So after being on Always, I had another assignment on Bounty Paper Towels. And then I was able to move into working on Alestra, which is where I met Kip Knight, who's the founder of CMO Coaches. We were working on a totally new nutraceutical that was going through the FDA clearance process. And then it was in that role that I was promoted to brand manager and then had the opportunity to become part of P&G's first management team in mainland China. So you got some international experience. And the ironic thing here is that working on Alestra, a product that had some challenges, eventually was labeled as potentially hazardous and caused people to have some, let's just say, leakage. (laughs) And ironically, that's a problem that you tackled later in your career. But before we get down that path, tell me a little bit about your international experience and how did that help shape who you are as a marketer? When I went to P&G, I went there explicitly with the vision for myself that I'd have the opportunity to work abroad one day. So when the opportunity came to be part of the mainland China first management team, I was incredibly excited about it. The challenge in China was really figuring out what the sequencing of the global brands would be into the country and then how obviously to optimize the marketing and business results of those brands in China. When I went there, it was shortly after Tiananmen. There were a number of American companies that pulled out of China. P&G had sort of a smaller import-export business set up there. But when I went in in the early part of the 1990s is when P&G really dedicated the resources to build a business there. I think across the time I was there, we went from zero to half a billion dollars. And we had a management team that we were able to maintain our continuity Probably the two biggest things I'm proud of there are developing global models, one again on Always, going back to some of my early roots in the company, and the second was on Oil of Olay. Mm -hmm. Working in China was in some ways being like in startup, the Wild West. Sounds like it was more like the Wild East, but yes, I know what you mean. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I think I probably read every book that you could imagine before I went over there. One of them I remember was called Bulls in the China Shop. And I remember reading about some of the things that went awry with uh, Westerners trying to do business in China. And some of the stories were so amazing, you just couldn't believe they happened. And what I can tell you is that what we experienced on the business was five times worse than anything that had been published in those books. (laughs) So you obviously had explosive growth at this point in building Procter & Gamble's business in China, but you're saying that the environment was, let's call it unstable. Talk to me about some of the ways that you were able to focus on the customers and what were some of the ways you were able to achieve that success? Probably one of the best examples of that is 
I think that sometimes figuring out the winning value proposition for your consumer isn't always a marketing message. Certainly in the case of China, building the value proposition really required us to work on the value piece. The Chinese were very interested in international brands, Western brands in particular. But in the early 90s, the most successful country in the East had been Japan. And the Japanese consumer is a very sophisticated consumer. At that juncture in China, trying to manufacture those products in China, the price differential versus what I'll call, let's just say, the local Chinese product and this international brand we were trying to bring in, the delta was just too high. So this was one of the few times in my career where the winning result in China for always was actually stripping down our product to a much more bare bones product than what it was, simply because we had to get to the right value and cost on the product to be successful. That's interesting. Going back to sort of marketing 101, the four Ps, it sounds like price was the big lever that was able to help you gain market share in China. Absolutely. And re-engineering our businesses to be able to deliver better value, so more economical pricing, required a retooling and really disrupting the status quo in our product supply organization. Mm -hmm. And that was very difficult to do. And as a marketer, you can imagine that your product supply organization isn't going to be very excited when you tell them that you need to redo the manufacturing of your products, for example. But I think what happened was once we were able to establish that we could win if we had the right product at the right price and what that required in terms of retooling on the product supply side, senior management and certainly our financial and CFO organization came along. And I think for me, being willing to disrupt the status quo when it was the right thing to do for the consumer and you could do it profitably to the company It was a recipe for success in Asia. And ultimately, when we talked maybe in a bit about the company I founded here in the States and the product we developed, we really were retooling and scaling back to get to the winning value proposition. It sounds like you had an impactful and let's call it foundational experience early in your career, getting not only marketing experience, working on a couple different products, understanding who the customer is, but also getting general management experience in a couple different environments. How did that vault you forward in your career? And what was your next step after working at Procter & Gamble? I loved every single day I went to work at P&G. And I think Had they been based in California where I grew up, I probably would have stayed with the company. But after five years in China, that was a career opportunity of a lifetime. I took a gap year and it was kind of the gap year I had always dreamed of taking, which was to take a year off and mountain climb around the world with the end game of landing myself back in California and doing what I love to do, which is developing the commercialization strategies for healthcare companies. So I took all of my P&G experience and then struck out on my own doing consulting for companies kind of at this intersection of where health and science technologies meet the consumer. So why was that industry so interesting to you? And tell me about your experience going out on your own. I would say first on the healthcare interest, I had loved working in the healthcare business at P&G. I would put the Always brand in that personal care category. When I had worked on Alestra, I had the opportunity to work with the FDA as well as a lot of nutritionists and dietitians. And I similarly had the opportunity to work in osteoporosis for a little bit for P&G as well. So it's just a sector of business that I've had personal affinity towards and really felt that often when you get it right, you truly have the opportunity to make a difference in someone's well-being or livelihood. Mm -hmm. So I chose to focus the consulting practice in the healthcare sector as I was getting started. I think the second part of your question was really about the transition into consulting. And I would say it takes some time to get a business started and going. It sounds like you've done some consulting in your time. And I think it was probably a good 12 to 18 months before I felt like I had my legs fully underneath me with this new business I was starting. 
As someone who's been consulting for three years, I'd say that you're at least a year and a half ahead of where I feel like I am, where every day is still trying to figure out where my feet and where the ground are. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about what made you feel secure. I think it was really just having some early success with a first couple of clients. And the clients I was working with were, I had to expand the practice and bring in a couple of other partners because every project it seemed like we did, they wanted us to continue to stay on board and do more work for them. I think the sweet spot that our consulting practice hit was in the Bay Area, there are a plethora of healthcare startups that are either pursuing new medical devices or pharmaceuticals. They're well-funded from a venture perspective with most of those dollars developed into clinical research. They tend to have technologist founders or scientific founders. So they just lack the expertise of commercialization strategy, business development, marketing strategy. So that was really the sweet spot of my experience, particularly coming out of PNG and with the broader experience I'd had in China. So it was a great match. And I did work for Flumis. That was a disruptive nasal spray flu vaccine that's now on the market. But at the time, it was still several years prior to their FDA approval. I worked with Agilent and then did a fair amount of work with Sosano, which was developing a dermal patch drug delivery system. So the interesting thing to me about the experience that you had as a consultant was that you were able to essentially think about who your customers were in terms of the consulting business and find a match for your skill set. And by that, I mean, you found a industry that was less likely to have any expertise in marketing, have technical scientific founders and match that with your understanding of not only the product development and operations and all of the sort of consumer packaged goods skills that you learn, but also the brand development and tactical marketing experience, the go-to-market skills as well. Tell me about, you ran a consulting business for roughly 11 years, uh, almost 12, it looks like. During that time, what was life like as a consultant? And how do you contrast that to being an in-house marketer? I would say there's pluses to both. I think the years I was doing consulting were timely and that it was across a time period where I was starting a family and had our three girls. So it allowed me some flexibility to do the work I love to do, but also do it in a way that didn't require the sort of 24-7 time commitment that often a senior executive C-level requires. So I was almost 11, 12 years that I was doing consulting. Across that time, I had been asked to come into some of the companies in a chief marketing role, but just wasn't really ready to be back in that role. It's something that I love. So when I had the opportunity to do that back in 2008, I jumped right into a VP marketing chief operating role with a startup with a client that had been developing a medical device that I'd been working with. And I'll never forget within three months of being back sort of in position, the feeling of how much I had missed it. So I certainly spent probably the next 10 years almost of my career working in an operating role, either initially for the startup that I went in to help and then eventually founding my own company. And then as we talked, I'm again doing some consulting here recently. So I feel fortunate that I've had the opportunity to really do both multiple times across my career. I had a conversation with my wife the other day. We recently recorded an episode with a woman who started a group that is the Women of MarTech. It'll be published after this episode. But My wife and I were talking about some of the challenges that women face in marketing and specifically that there tends to be a lack of volume in terms of women leaders. And I don't mean that there is a lack of quality women leaders. It's just that women weren't given the opportunity as much as men 30 years ago to move forward in their career. So we see fewer of them in executive roles. One of the things that sticks out to me is that you were able to find a way to balance both raising a family and continuing to develop your career, which to me seems like a challenge. Obviously, I am not a woman, but it seems to be one of the biggest challenges women face that want to move forward to an executive level in their career. What advice do you have for younger women in marketing that are facing, starting, and managing a family 
being a mom at home and also being in the working world? And how do you continue to progress your career while still fielding your obligations at home? Honestly, it's a question I think that we don't talk enough about. Two immediate things come to mind. The first is that I have been very fortunate to have great mentors across my entire career. And when I say great mentors, I would say that they're probably equally split men and women. So I'm fortunate that my first boss at P&G was a woman. In our line, we had an associate marketing manager who was a woman. And I've had some great female role models and mentors that are both women and men. I feel those mentors have really supported me across my career. And, you know, it's interesting. If I reflect back today, I can tell you that most of the early mentors I had back when I started my career are people that I have stayed in touch with across my entire career, despite the fact that it's been over 20 years since I've been at P&G. So the role of mentors, I think, is extremely important. The second and more controversial statement that I'll make to you is that I think it's a real myth that you can have it all. I was probably brought up in an era where young women moving into all different kinds of career opportunities that our mothers hadn't had, for example, were brought up with a you can have it all promise. I think that you can't and you can have it all. It's just you have it at different times, if that makes sense. So how you think about your career over time becomes very important. The investment that I made in my career at P&G, for example, has served me in good stead across my entire career. It's allowed me the opportunity to be a consultant and be a successful consultant at the same time when my three girls were toddlers. And the combination of that P&G experience and my consulting experience allowed me then to go into operating roles in a couple of startups where my kids didn't see me as much as they might have wanted to on many a week or an evening between traveling and just the commitments of any C-level type role, if that makes sense. So I think the biggest piece of advice would be that you can have it all, but not at the same time. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It sounds like you have to understand that you're going to have to make some trade-offs and being aware and accepting of them as opposed to expecting to fit 48 hours into a single day. That's some of the challenges that women are faced. And I also will add that I think that you moving from being in-house to being a consultant and finding a role that allowed you to continue to stay in the working world and have the type of balance that made sense for you is a creative solution. And at the time, I don't know how many people were running consulting businesses. And now, at least to me, it feels like something that is generally more accepted. So I think that you were very creative in the way that you approached continuing to develop your career and building the flexibility that you needed to be successful at home as well. Well, and I love working and I always have. So I would really encourage people who take time off to find opportunities to do consulting even if it's not full time, to keep them current and engaged. So talk to me a little bit about the transition. You mentioned that you went from running your consulting group to a startup, but eventually you started your own company. Tell me about that experience. And you were actually the CEO and CMO of another health-related company. What was that experience like? It was an experience of a lifetime for someone who started in brand management to actually create a product. Myself, my husband, and two former P&G executives, the four of us sort of came up with this idea in a living room and to take it from an idea to actually making the product in our garage and developing a non-woven product on our own and finding a contract manufacturer and then raising all the venture capital to actually bring it all to life was an opportunity of a lifetime that I certainly would do all over again. We developed a product for a condition that affects 20 million people. I think not everybody knows that one in five women over the age of 40 have what I like to call is little bowel leak. And the quality of life impacts for people who experience this are tremendously high. I have to say, without trying to make too many dirty jokes about the subject matter, the fact that you were on the Always brand and work developing maxi pads and tampons and then were on the product management team at Alestra 
a product that was known to create anal leakage. And then down the road, you became the person that created essentially the maxi pad to stop anal leakage just seems so logical to me, whether that was how you actually created the idea of the product or what led you into it may not be true, but it seems like a very logical path to get from point A to B to butterfly health. You're not the first person that's made that observation, but it was definitely serendipitous. It can't be that random. <laughs> not. It just sort of happened. I'll tell you that our co-founders on Butterfly, Elizabeth Ron, who I mentioned was my first brand manager, and her husband, Carl Ron, who worked in product development at P&G. So three of our four founders were former always people. But I think we just had a different way to skin the cat. And I think having worked in that general anatomy of leakage, I'd worked in the incontinence business previously, you know, the challenge, and I think this is the disruption, the opportunity that we saw was that more people have little bowel leaks than big bowel leaks. And the only products really available were disposable briefs or diapers, and they were way overkill for the problem. So when we finally understood that we're talking about little leaks, it just intuitively made sense to us to try and figure out, could we develop a product that we could tuck up in the bum and have it adhere and not be painful, right? Comfortable to wear and provide the protection that people required. So I think I mentioned to you in China, I was sort of worked on stripping down a pad back to the bare bones. Mm -hmm. And I think in the case of Butterfly, we were trying to get out of the mindset of requiring essentially a diaper for a problem that really required a very small, discrete pad that we could just tuck up in your bum. Here's the thing that sticks out to me from a marketing perspective with the Butterfly Health product line. This is a product that people probably don't want to think about and definitely don't want to talk about. So talk to me about some of the challenges you face as a marketer building a brand and doing your customer acquisition in something that is inherently a discrete problem people don't want to publicize. I'm really glad you asked this question. It's probably cuts at the heart of one of the things that I think made us most proud when we were doing all of the early testing on this product. And AC Nielsen runs all kinds of product testing that a lot of the packaged goods companies use to sort of vet new product ideas and consumer use panel testing. And the first time we did a full panel of product use where we would place product and then people would respond back post-use to a questionnaire, the first thing that Nielsen told us was they just couldn't believe it because in the incontinence category in general, and also for stomach upset categories where people are developing products, things that are either taboo or that make us feel uncomfortable or we don't like, that oftentimes a product will get rated well for efficacy, meaning for its performance, but it will still get rated very low on the important attribute of likability. So I may give this incontinence pad five stars on performance and working well, but on liking it, I'm probably going to still give it a one or a two because I don't like that I have this problem. And what totally turned Nielsen inside out was butterfly scores were not only five star on efficacy, the product really works, but on likability, we hit a five as well. People loved the product. I could totally relate. I worked for a startup that does dry cleaning and laundry delivery. And the thing that occurred to us is we were competing against an industry with an average NPS score of zero. Nobody really thinks very fondly of their dry cleaner because chances are eventually they screw up one shirt and then they're considered a bad performer. So that was the expectation for the brand we were trying to build. So anything above that zero NPS felt like a huge success. Exactly. So in our case, we did a couple of things. One is I think we put very accessible language around the whole problem. We weren't calling this fecal incontinence, which is what the medical professionals call it. We were calling it accidental bowel leakage and little bowel leaks. And I think we didn't really have a chance to talk about it today, but 
part of changing the language and taboo subjects is something that I feel very passionate about and have published a couple of clinical articles on because you have to be able to talk to people in accessible language and words. So I think we built a whole way of talking about this issue and developed a product that really was elegant in terms of providing a really simple solution to a very difficult problem with accessible language and branding butterfly for gosh sakes, right? The product looks like a butterfly. If you ever look it up, right, it had four wings. So we were just able to create something that resonated very strongly with people who have this issue. And it is a little problem that really has huge quality of life impacts for people. So when we saw the likability scores, in addition to the ratings on product satisfaction and value proposition, et cetera, we knew we had a winner. And that ultimately was proven out in market by the number of new product awards that the product won. And Butterfly had the highest consumer satisfaction of any health and beauty product, I think, launched in 2014. That was based on all the health and beauty sector online product reviews, I believe. To me, the headline that you need to put on your LinkedIn or your resume or wherever you talk about your career is you were able to describe a company that solved the problem of anal incontinence with elegance. <laughs> like that is the sign of a great marketer if there ever was one. So congratulations for being able to accomplish that. Tell me a little bit about the experience, not only being the CEO, but also being responsible for the marketing at the same time. How did you balance those two roles at once? At the beginning, I think it was natural for the CMO and CEO roles to be combined in me because so much of our early brand building and product building and value proposition, that was at the heart of what the company was about. Over time, it was clear as we began to scale that we needed the infrastructure and support of my attention in the CEO role and bringing in supporting executive level marketing resources as the company grew. So eventually you moved on from Butterfly Health. Tell us about the reason why you decided to move on from that organization and what are you doing today? So with Butterfly, we had been a venture-backed entity. And the patience and time and financial resources uh, necessary to scale, we just simply ran out of capital and runway on the venture side. So the business was eventually sold to another consumer products company that would have the scale and resources and patience, most importantly, to invest in growing the category. You know, if you look at any new category on the consumer product side, it tends to be five to 10 years to really establish the category. And in the venture space for consumer products, they don't typically have that long. So we exited the business in 2016. Since then, I've been doing some guest lecturing on marketing at the Stanford Biodesign Fellows Program. I also started a nonprofit Healthy Mature Living Foundation with the sole objective of supporting some of these unmet yet taboo health needs and trying to figure out how do we get education and new product solutions for some of these unmentionable issues in the mature, healthy aging sector. So thinking about your career arc as a whole, the fascinating thing to me is you've essentially specialized in marketing products that people don't want to talk about. To me, that's an incredibly, obviously nuanced form of marketing, but also an incredibly interesting career path. So as you look back on your career and you realize where you ended up as opposed to where you thought you were going to end up where you started, how do you reconcile the journey that you've taken? Do you feel like this was the path you were always intending to go down or is your career path something that just naturally unfolded? If you had asked me a year or two into my career at P&G, I probably would have told you I would have been a lifer, meaning I would have been happy to stay at P&G across the course of my career. I think the challenge for me became as I looked up at some of those career opportunities, there were a couple of things. One is that 
clearly staying with P&G meant at some point being in Cincinnati, which wasn't where my home was. And two, while there were some outstanding female role models at P&G in middle management when I was early in my career, the ones that were in executive management didn't tend to have families. So the retooling I think I did when I was in China was having a desire to be back in California and ultimately also at some point wanting to be able to have a family. And it seemed like starting a consulting practice might be the best way to potentially support that. I think I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. I had a couple of businesses when I was young. I had a small catering cookie business when I was in college. So I've always felt very comfortable in a small business environment also, as much as I still enjoy a large corporate environment. So I'm not sure I would have been able to predict it, but I certainly feel like I've had an incredible career to date and look forward to a few decades more of contribution. I still don't believe you that the path from the always brand to Alestra didn't lead you into butterfly health, but <laughs> I think it's an incredible career story and a really interesting way to get into some brands that are obviously impactful, but also something that a lot of people would never think about as a career path. So let me just say, Kelly, I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you telling us about your experiences as a marketer, and thank you for being our guest. You're welcome. It was a lot of fun, and I look forward to you joining us at the CMO Bootcamp. I can't wait for it. And that wraps up this episode of CMO Week on the MarTech Podcast. Thank you to Kelly Brzozowski for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about Kelly, you can find the link to her LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you can send her a tweet at Kelly Brzozowski, that's K-E-L-L-Y-B-R-E-Z-O-C-Z-K-Y. If you're a subscriber to the MarTech Podcast, thanks for being a member of our community. We always want to hear from you, so we created benjshap.com slash question, where you can send us your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. My handle is benjshap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P, on LinkedIn, Twitter, pretty much every social profile. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a weekly stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we've got some great episodes lined up over the next few weeks. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed next week. Okay, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.